Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Aho here with KissAnalog.com. All right, so this is the, what I've been calling the 20 watt Class A amplifier. It's actually a little higher power than that. Uh, we're gonna kind of give some specs. I'm not sure exactly how much power I can get out now. It depends on how I get everything set up. So I, I think it's closer to 30 watts. Um, anyways, we'll see. And that's in the eight ohms. I've gotten 40, like 47, just less than 50 watts in a 4 ohm, so we'll see how this works out. Anyway, in the last video, you saw me uh, do some troubleshooting to try to correct, find out what, why the darn thing wasn't working. So, um, a little background, this amp, I built it, sent it over to a friend's house, we listened to it for a number of weekends, sounded awesome, and He's heard. He's listened to some other amps I've built, and he's he wants this one back because this one is just not the magical. It's just got more umph. It's got it. I don't know a lot of clarity, like he as he describes it, like the you know the uh, st sound stage or whatever. It's just really open. It just really has uh, a good sound, and it's a class A amplifier. Uh, so the other amplifiers I send them, I don't know if they. Uh, they're rated for more power, but because of the way his uh, system's set up, I don't think they're putting out as much power. This one's designed for his system. Uh, he has a, a little bit lower uh, output voltage from his turntable. So this guy, I boosted up the, um, the amplifier stage on the front end to give a little bit more boost. So uh, that way he doesn't need a preamplifier. He can go directly into this and works out great. Well, anyway, I brought it back to, to fix a switch and to do some cosmetic stuff mostly. Uh, and, you know, I broke something. <laughs> and, and then the thing I thought I broke I turned into something else and something else. And, and the switch, getting a new switch, turned out not to be trivial either. So this is a pretty small condensed box, as you guys have seen. The last video kind of showed some troubleshooting I did to get to the point of this video. Let's jump into this and I'll show you what I did to uh, fix the problem. All right, guys, in the last video, I found that this 10K, the voltage I got at pin seven was not at the 10K resistor. So the question is, is you know, is the connection from pin 7 to 10K not there? And so that's what we're going to check for. So I'm going to probe from pin 7 of this chip to both sides of the 10K just to see um, if I have any connection. All right, guys, so I'm just showing you a close-up of the board. Here's pin 7, and there's a 10K resistor. Now... You'll hear continuity beep if it has continuity. If it's less than, I think, 20 ohms, my meter is set for. And in both cases, I don't get any continuity. There's my, the Hioki. The Hioki DT4282 actually shows you the ohms you have selected. I, I can select and change that. But it shows the ohms that's selected. So if it's under 20 ohms, that beeper will go off. Really like that. A lot of people don't understand that about the continuity tech checkers. They think it means short, but it doesn't. All right, I'll pull out my trusted Redeer uh, tools. I really like these things. You just kind of push them over, kind of a knockoff of maybe a more expensive tool you might recognize. But anyway, uh, they're coated here for, you know, so in case you're working on live circuits, a thousand volts rated. I just wanted to show this again because I really like this tool and it has all the different heads so I can take off these kind of heads that I have in this holding this uh, heat spreader, this board, down to this heat sink. So I'll go ahead and pull it off so we can look at the other side. All right, so uh, what I found was this is pin seven right here where my probe is and this via right here, it's not connected to that, but that little via is connect you can hear it right 
Okay, so that is connected to to that guy, but yeah, it's not connected here. Now, I can see it's difficult to tell because of the black masking, but looking really close, it's hard to tell, but I can tell the trace is on the other side. That's why the via comes through and runs down this side. So it's on the this top surface, and so the solder connection looks good here, but either the trace is broken on the other side, which I think it probably must be, because which is weird. So that m must be why I didn't notice, because when I heated it up and I removed the socket, I must not have noticed I lifted the pad on this side of the board, on this top side. So I can... I can run a little wire from here over to here and connect those, no problem. Uh, so, yeah, because the solder connections do look good from here, and that must be the problem. And by the way, just as a, I, I still have this one in the package, but I punctured through just to sanity check myself to make sure this guy does connect to that. Uh, resistor right there and it does so it definitely is broken connection on this board and by the way uh, just to show the Hyoki when I short them show you what it looks like because you can hear it right it shows the ohms and the red display and the loud buzz All right, guys, so I keep some bus wire around, uh, and this this wire here is the actual spool that I have. I keep this around just for these kind of purposes. So, um, yeah, there you go. By the way, this is 20 gauge, so it's kind of heavy. It's heavier than what I need for this. I could use something like 26 gauge, 24 gauge, but I, I buy 20 gauge just for... Uh, general purpose so it's kind of good for everything and um anyway i'll put links down below appreciate using those links all right guys it's a little hard to do with the camera on but i'm going to try so what i do is i put a little solder like a ball of solder on the end of the wire so then that way and i make sure the pad has some solder on it too and then that way i can just hold the wire and not have to hold solder and wire and solder and iron. And that gets really hot really fast, guys. Let that cool. And then I'll cut it and uh, to length so it fits. And one nice thing about the stiff wire, by the way, I'm 20 gauge. If I was running it around something or whatever, it's stiff enough to kind of stay put. But in this case, I can run diagonally right over to the pad, no problem. The only thing in the way is that via, which is also the same, you know, connection point. So no issues there. Now, by the way, you know, you guys might do a whole lot more rework or this kind of stuff than I do. So you can have, I'm sure there's people with good points. But what I'll do, the, uh, this little pad here. Everything was snipped off pretty short, so it's not a lot to grab onto. So what I'll do is hold something like this down on that, and then just kind of twist the wire to, you know, halfway around it. You don't have to make a huge mechanical connection, just something to hold it in place for you to solder. And you notice I didn't snip it yet. I'm going to leave it there because the spools probably might be helping hold it in place. So I'm just going to solder this thing and... Just try to get the pad and the wire hot so you get a good solder connection. And I try not to leave any burrs or any sharp pointy things for EMI or any noise. I just try to give a nice smooth connection. And then I have these angle cutters. These are really sweet. I've had these for so many years I don't even want to tell you. But they're x light expensive. But I'm sure there's... These days, less expensive ones, but x -Lite is an excellent brand. They're x -Lite brand. But anyway, so then I can come down here and nip it right, right there. There we go. Good connection. 
All right, now before I put it down, I'll go ahead and power it up because I don't really need heat sinking for this test. All right, so I brought the voltage up um, to about plus minus 13 volts roughly, not exact. So I'll hold this down here and we'll go to pins. Uh, well, here, let's just go to the output voltage. I'm just gonna come over here and touch the output voltage pin. And look at that, 12 millivolts, minus 12, that's pretty close to zero, right? Uh, there's some voltage drops and so on. So that, uh, hey, guys, I think we fixed it, solved the problem. So let's go to pin seven now. And look, it used to be minus 10 volts, now it's 138 millivolts. That is awesome. Okay, that's pin seven, that was the output. Let's go to pins five and six, which are the inputs. It's pin five, minus 6.65 millivolts. And six is 0.9 millivolts. So then the output is pin seven, 137 millivolts. Pretty sweet. All right, so at this point, what I need to do is bolt this thing back down, okay? Uh, get my wiring all kind of straightened out. Take off the power supply wiring that's going into here and wire it to the actual transformer winding. And see, I've got, yeah, I've got all kinds of wiring just to test this board by itself, which is causing a little bit of noise. So I'll put all this together and yeah. And then we'll test it again. We'll look at the output and run up some power, make sure everything's clean. One last thing I'm gonna do is make sure I don't have any 60 Hertz buzz. At first there wasn't any, but then he thought he heard some. So what I might do, well, I'll show you how I'm gonna solve that if there is any. We'll look for that and solve that. But right now it looks like it's gonna work. So let's go ahead and put button it up. Okay, by the way, I just wanna mention why I'm screwing this in is I did re-grease it and I put some nice thermal grease on there to clean it up after taking it apart and putting it together a few times. So just wanted to freshen up the grease, make sure it's spread nice and neat and all that kind of stuff. And one thing I think I like about the screwdriver is the nice soft rubber in between the hard ones. So it's just nice to use. Anyway, so yeah, re-grease it. Everything's looking good. And Everything's looking good and we should be good to go. So I just kind of wanted to point out the power wires. They're right here. They go up to this terminal block and I have these little teeny wires coming into the terminal block. And look, I just popped one out. So that's why the connection wasn't so hot. But anyway, I'll put these terminal wires back in that terminal block, get it nice and tight, snug. And yeah, so we should be a lot better off. And by the way, when I power it up again, I'll bring it up slowly again. I'll use my Variac over there to bring up this AC power slowly. And so I can still control the voltage and make sure everything looks good. The benefit of the power supplies up here is I could look at the individual current on each one. I can do that here because I can put a loop on these wires, but it was just easy to use a lap power supply. All right, so yeah, I when I removed that chip carrier, uh, I guess I pulled a pad off the board. I inspected the back side really well, and it looked great. And I guess I I just didn't. I should have thought about looking at both sides of the board. When I removed it, it came off fairly easy. I, I was pretty careful heating up, removing all the solder before I tried to pull it out. So it came out pretty easily. So yeah, it's kind of interesting that that pad got damaged, but. I noticed on some of the pads on this board, many of them look great. Some of them have a small ring around them. The pad's not big enough. And uh, I think this was one of those cases. So yeah, anyway, when you remove parts, tip, tip to those who know better. <laughs> when you remove parts, look at both sides of the board, make sure the board's in good shape. I use this, uh, this little guy here so I can look at things real close because my eyes aren't actually that bad, but it's when you're looking at small things, it's nice to zoom in so they look gigantic. So you can see the small uh, 
issues. Now, I probably could have saw what happened there with the, my eyeballs, <laughs> probably. I don't know. Um, I didn't remove the chip carrier again to inspect what was damaged. I just repaired it on the one side of the board. So everything's good. I fired it up, did an initial check, looks good. In this video, I'm going to... So in the next video, I'm going to do some testing on this. We'll come up and we'll say, okay, this is how much power we have before distortion. And we'll set it up again. I'll set up the bias again. And I had the bias set really hot, by the way, when he, um, when my friend had it. And the box got so warm, after about 20 minutes when it warmed up, it was pretty hot. So probably 20 minutes to half an hour, it, it got pretty warm and pretty hot, actually. I mean, you could touch it, but you didn't want to hold it very long. So it was that hot. And this is a big, chunky, the face plates are big and chunky. Uh, it's got a lot of heat sinking, uh, but without air movement, just class A, just sitting there, it's gonna get hot, whether you're playing music or not. So I wanted to uh, twist it down just a little bit, let it run a little bit cooler. So a class A B amplifier will kind of be in class A at very low powers, but you know, it goes into A B. So setting up a, a pure class A you'd have it in the bias region at half your power, at least half your power. But really, as the sound gets up louder, I don't know if you need the class A, uh, you know, once it gets up to the highest volumes. So I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to fit, work this out. I'm gonna test it, do some testing to see how much class A, say 20 watts, 15 watts, something like that, where it'd be in class A mode, and then when you go above that, it would go into A, B. But by then, you're you're pretty much class A anyway. So anyways, uh, what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. Appreciate you watching. Thank you. And watch the next video where we test this thing out and we set up the bias and everything. I might do the next video just setting up the bias and the power. And then do a follow-up video where we do, you know, Boldy plots. Uh, distortion over frequency over power all that kind of stuff and as far as those kind of tests go let me know what you guys think are important and let me ask you your input on this just a you know point of conversation I see some people testing the square waves and trying to show the response of the amplifier where I really feel I don't know how I feel about that a square wave is totally not music it's, I don't know what it tells you about the amplifier, honestly. If there's some ringing and it dampens out, I don't know if that really matters. If you put 20 kilohertz, 40 kilohertz, let's say this rolls off at 30 kilohertz. Um, it's not designed to have those sharp moving edges. It's supposed to be rolling off, so it's going to try to flatten them out. And, you know, so I don't know, it's kind of like running your gasoline car on diesel fuel what's the point like oh it runs on diesel and gas all the better really if you only put gas in it does it matter how it runs on diesel <laughs> and if it does run on both diesel and gas does it run optimally on gas that's that's the big question i have if you put the reins on something is that what you want or do you want it to be able to react quickly uh, to quick music notes where maybe you have two music notes side by side? Do you want it to be able to act quickly or do you put the, want to put the reins on it, a leash on it, so that it's well behaved? Uh, so what do you guys think about that? Let me know in the comments, okay? I'm curious. I know it, it looks like an interesting test and gives interesting results, but... Is it just putting diesel in your, you know, in your unleaded car? I don't know. Anyway, all right. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time. Back to the amp.